Studying the book of Revelation is, uh, is a great study, and there's so, uh, so many verses, so many parts to it that are hard to understand. And what I would like you to do this evening is, if you find anything that I say that you're puzzled, please send a message or a text, and when I preach it the next week, we can answer the question that you ask if it's not too hard. But also, afterwards, when we're having tea, let's talk and engage with God's Word and say to someone next to you, either that was interesting or you found it hard, that we are students of the Word. We want to gain a knowledge from the book of Revelation. So let's ask questions and discuss it afterwards with each other. One thing I'm going to say is some of you are going to be disappointed this evening. The reason I say that is that I've been told that some of you have been listening to David Jeremiah in Revelation, you've been listening to John MacArthur in Revelation, and they're amazing. Well, let me tell you, I'm not amazing, and I'm not David Jeremiah, and I'm not John MacArthur, and I'm none of them, but what is amazing is the Word of God. That's what is amazing, and that's what I pray that we will a study and listen to what God has to say in the book of Revelation. Tonight, I only intend to read three verses, one to three. Next week, Lord willing, four to eight, and then finish in nine to 20, and, that, and then we'll resume again in January. We'll have a break in December for we have different things on. So that's how I intend to go through the book of Revelation. Then we'll do the seven churches in chapter two to three, And then four to five, we get a glimpse into heaven, which are amazing chapters. And then six to 19, we have chapters of judgment. And then we come to the finale, the conclusion. I would say about about the book of Revelation is it cannot be understood independent of other books in the Bible. So that's why it's important that we will refer to Daniel and Zechariah and Ezekiel. And Lord willing, I would love to do a study in Ezekiel and Zechariah and that, because these are great books uh, for us today, because in these books, they, they tell us of a great God, and they are wonderful books. So we'll tie them in with the book of Revelation as we preach. We're reading verses 1 to 3. I do encourage you to come if you've got a Bible on your phone or Bible... Uh, pages, or however you've got the Bible, it's important that we are tonight looking at what God has to say and referring to what the, the Scriptures say. So, we're just going to read verses 1 to 3, the Revelation to John. Verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave Him to show to His servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the Word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. For the time is near. What does the future hold? What does the future hold as we look around at the, at the world? What's the future hold in regards to climate change? How is the world going to be affected What does the future hold for nations? You look at countries like Iran and China and Russia, we see terrorism. The past couple of years, COVID has left uh, many asking questions. What does the future hold? What does the future hold for the Christian church? What does it hold for the church in this country? What does the future hold for me and for you? Many people are asking this question. That is why I 
can't remember it off the top of my head, the amount of people that do their horoscopes, which is quite frightening. People are turning because they want to find out what the future holds. I read an article in the paper called The Flawed Art of Super Forecasting. And it was how governments and medical and gave you different examples of people that have forecasted and the forecasts have been horribly wrong. The first fo super forecaster that I came across was in 1978. And it goes like this. Some of you will remember this. We are on the march with Ali's army. We are going to the Argentine. And we'll really shake them up when we win the World Cup for Scotland are the greatest football team. And some of you are laughing, and it's, we actually, that was Ali McLeod. Last year, I watched two documentaries, this, sorry, one documentary, and I'm twice, because Ali McLeod had actually us believing that Scotland were going to come back with the World Cup. Well, he was sadly wrong, because no one, none of us can say what tomorrow will bring. None of us can say what the future holds. There is only one, and that person who knows the future is God. Apart from God, no one knows the future. And God has revealed it in His Word. We have in our Bibles, in the beginning of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was a beginning to everything, a beginning to this world, a beginning to the nations, a beginning for us. There was Genesis is the book of beginnings. But when we come to Revelation, we come to the book of endings. Endings as to we see it, the world that we live in, the universe, the endings of nations as we know it, the ending of governments. Revelation brings us to the ending of time. But Revelation also gives us eternity. This morning I stood over at the, the square as we listened. I listened to Revelation 21, verse 1 to 7 being read. It's actually a break in verse 9. It goes on to give you the New Jerusalem I wish they'd read verse 8 too, because verse 8 is, to the unbelieving and the fearful, their part is in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. And when we're actually in the book of Revelation, and brothers and sisters, we are coming to the end of time, we will come into eternity, and each one of us will face eternity. It's such a sobering thought. And one I'll address again at the end tonight, eternity. God has a plan and a program in the book of Revelation. And God isn't there like us, taken by surprise when things happen. COVID-19 didn't surprise God because God allowed it. And God isn't perplexed when we see China and the troubles in different parts of the world, God isn't perplexed. We have to realize this, is that God is pulling the threads together for, the, for what we're about to see in the book of Revelation. I remember when I was young, I had a paper round, and I used to run down on a Thursday morning to... The, get the papers, six o'clock in the morning, uh, with a knife in my hand to get them before they even got to the shop. Did 60 P&Js for three pounds a week. That was back a few years ago. And I was really excited to, and nervous as I had a torch. It wasn't a torch on an iPhone. It was a torch to open the papers. And I got to the back page to find out the score. And that was the days that Aberdeen were winning every week. I wanted to see the score. Who won? And when we come to the book of Revelation, we come to the back pages, we come to the very end, and what do we find? We find that God wins. That God conquers and God is triumphant. And we are not left in this book to speculate. 
We're only left here to preach it. And I trust as we come to these great truths uh, over the next few weeks and months, Lord willing, it will have a profound effect upon our lives. If you was to start in chapter 6 and go on to the end of Revelation and to see the judgments and then come back to verse 1 and be asked to fill, to fill in the revelation of what? What would you put in? What I would put in is this, the revelation of God's judgment. But that's not what the book of Revelation says. The book of Revelation isn't the revelation, it says, of God's judgment, although God's judgment is there. What is the book of Revelation about? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation, I think, has 26 expressions of different names for Jesus. The one that's most popular is Lamb. It occurs 28 times in the book of Revelation. It is the, re the revealing, the unveiling, the manifestation of Jesus Christ. This year, I think it was this year that Prince William and Harry went, uh, were, taken a, were standing when a statue of their mother was unveiled. And the common people that wrote about it said that it didn't uh, look like Princess Diana at all, and they would have been disappointed with what they saw. But when the veil, the unveiling in Revelation, and the curtain is drawn aside in this book, there will be no disappointment. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And when we think of the revelation, the revealing of the Lord Jesus, we think of His coming. We think of His first coming. How did He come the first time? He came as a baby in a manger. He was born in a manger. His parents, Joseph and Mary, had to take him to flee into Egypt. He came back to, to Nazareth. He grew up in Nazareth. And then he served his ministry from the age of 30, was, around, was from Capernaum. And at the age of 33, the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. The cry was, there was no welcome for him when he came, and the cry was, away with this man, he was rejected. He was a rejected one. He came to die, and they cried away with this man. What a contrast to his second coming. And we have got to make this clear uh, as I go through Revelation, and I know some of you may disagree with this, and I, I will say this again in a, a short while, is that Revelation is actually a book that we can have different interpretations. But when we come to the second coming of the Lord Jesus, I believe from Scripture that the Lord Jesus Christ will come first for His church, and seven years later, He will come back to judge. And I believe that we have to keep that clear as we're going through the revelation. When He comes back to judge is mostly what the revelation is about the revelation of Jesus Christ. I just want to read what John Phillips said about this day when he comes back, when the Lord Jesus is revealed. One day, however, he is coming back with this, his glory unveiled to smash the opposition of the world and to wield a scepter of iron. He is coming back in pomp and power to reign, backed by the hosts of heaven. His deity manifest even now to the eye of faith will blaze forth like flaming lightning then. In the book of Revelation, the person of Christ is unveiled, and we are given view after view of that glorious man who will fill all heaven with his praise. And what a sight that will be. And in the book of Revelation, in the Gospels, when we come to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Lord Jesus is presented to us in His first coming as what? As a Savior. But when He comes back, after He takes His church home, He comes back as a mighty warrior to judge the unconverted and judge the nations. Some of the Psalms, I could have gone to, sorry, uh, Isaiah or Ezekiel or Jeremiah or Zechariah and gathered, but I decided to go to some of the Psalms to 
give us a glimpse of what will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed as a judge, as a mighty warrior. And the first one is in Psalm chapter 45, where we've got these words, and gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one, with your glory and your majesty. That's how the Lord Jesus is going to come. O mighty one, the sword upon his thigh. And then he is going to, we get further in Psalm 110, where we have got, sit at my right hand, says the Lord. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. Verse, the next verse is, he shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink, and it's picturing the Lord Jesus as a mighty warrior, now stopping as he is judging among the nations, stopping by the brook to drink. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside, and then he is, he is, his strength has been recovered to carry on. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. And then in Psalm 2, as to the opposition he will face, it says here, that you shall break them with a rod of iron, you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. And that is quite stunning prophecy in the Psalms as to the Lord Jesus coming again. And when John saw this, the unveiling, the curtain being drawn aside, how did John feel? John, who had laid in the breast of Jesus, John, who had sought, seen the compassion and the kindness and the love of Christ towards, a, towards the needy person, towards the helpless, is now seeing the curtain being drawn aside. And what is John seeing in these, in these verses in Revelation is this. It is the returning, conquering king, returning to reign. That is what the Lord Jesus is seeing it, sorry, John is seen in the book of Revelation. Let's stop for a moment and go back to the Gospels. And when was, what, what did the world see? The la, what did they, they see of the Lord Jesus? What did the world last see of the Savior was this? They saw him hanging upon a cross. Above the cross were these words, this is Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. They looked at him, and his visage was marred more than any other man. That you passed by the cross, he was unrecognizable. And then they looked as they saw Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, going in, getting the body. And Nicodemus, they took the body of Christ, stone cold body of the Lord Jesus Christ, with the marks of the nails in his hands, his face unrecognizable. And they took him and they laid him in a tomb. That is the last the world saw of Christ. And now in Revelation, the world is going to see this, and we're going to come to this in verse 7. When we come, behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierce him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. What a sad day that will be for this world when he comes in judgment. He comes as a returning, conquering king. And what happens when he comes? Well, this, and we'll see this in the book of Revelation. Uh, there's a prophecy in Zechariah. It speaks of the Lord Jesus. He will come and plant his feet on the Mount of Olives. And then he will r ride on and come into Jerusalem. And on that day, Psalm 24 will be fulfilled, where it says, Lift up ye gates, ye heads, and the King of glory shall come in. And the gates of the doors of Jerusalem will be opened, and the King of glory, our Lord Jesus Christ, will come in. And the prophecy that Gabriel was, Mary received from Gabriel will be fulfilled on that day. When he, when it says, You shall call his name Jesus, he shall be great. 
And the Lord God shall give him the throne of David his father, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob for the ages to come. The Lord Jesus will come in to Jerusalem. He will sit on the throne of David his father. And Psalm 2 will be fulfilled on that day because he's not only a returning king, he's returning to reign. When it says in Psalm 2, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. And then he comes to rule as Psalm, 24, as Psalm 22 says. He trusted in the Lord, let them rescue him. No, it's, it's verse 28, sorry, Graham. It says, for the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the, revel- he rules over the nations. What is the book of Revelation about? What is the book of Revelation about? It is the revealing. The purpose of the book of Revelation is a manifestation of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a revealing of the glory of Jesus. He is the center of everything. And when we, when we come into the book of Revelation, as today there is opposition, there will be opposition in that day. When the Lamb opens the seals in Revelation chapter 6, and the trumpets are sounded, and the bowls of the fury of God are poured out. We find opposition in chapters 12 to 13. We'll see the dragon, the trinity of evil, with the dragon, the, fo- the beast, and the false prophet. We'll see at Armageddon how they will turn against Christ. And what we'll find is this in the book of Revelation, is that Christ wins. The Lamb wins, He conquers. So the book of Revelation is what? It is the revealing of the glory of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we come on to verse, I'll come back to, sorry, a part of verse 1, but I'll just go on a bit uh, here. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. It's very interesting this about the book of, uh, book of Revelation, is it? If you was to pass on a message to someone and they passed it on to someone else, it's like Chinese whispers, and they pass it on to someone else, by the time it gets to the end, the chances of it being the same message are very slim. But in the book of Revelation, we have five links in the chain of authorship. Because this is it. God, first of all, gave it in verse 1 to him. He gave it to the Lord Jesus. And then he made it known by sending his angel. So he gave it next to his angel. And then to his servant John, and then to us. So there are five links in the chain of authorship in Revelation. It's as if this truth is such a precious truth, such a treasure, it's being guarded. So God gives it to Christ, Christ to an angel, an angel to John, and then we have the book of Revelation. And John says in verse 2, who bore witness to the Word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's the Word of God. The book of Revelation is the Word of God. It's dependable and it is reliable. And John says at the end of verse 2, all that he saw. Fifty-four times he speaks of what he saw what he saw. Thirty-seven times he says, what I saw. And this is the book of Revelation. It's not John's imagination imagination running wild. It's John is writing down what has been revealed to him, the Word of God. And in verse 3, we have, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear. So why is it that we don't speak enough on the book of Revelation. Why do you think it is we don't preach enough in it? When was the last time you heard the book of Revelation being preached? When was the last time that we had series on the second coming or so many other of these truths? Why are we not speaking about them? Because there is a particular blessing in reading and preaching the book of Revelation. There is a blessing in reading every part of the Bible, but the book of Revelation is the only book in the Bible where there is a blessing said to be reading it. It's as if there is a double blessing. 
So why do we not read and preach more on the book of Revelation? Well, I think one is we can be quite divided in regards to what it says. Number two, I think, is we think it's confusing. It's got so many symbols and signs that we think it's too hard. Do you know why that we think like that? I believe we think like that because the devil wants us to think like that because the book of Revelation gives us his ending and he doesn't want us to preach about his ending. But the, there is a blessing in the book of Revelation. Why did I read, want to read it? I read it because I believe God laid it upon my heart to read it. Elizabeth was about to fall asleep one night and I said to her, there are seven things I think is relevant in Revelation, and she mumbled and said something. I just watched, she says, seven's too many, so I've took it down to six. <laughs> so after I said six, I think she was asleep. So I'm just hoping that I can point out my six reasons why I think and I really feel this is why we're reading Revelation. One is this, it lets us see Jesus. I was in a webinar yesterday, I'll say something about it, what he said later, and he said this, he's written a book, and it's called, he's a director of apologetics at Cambridge, and he's written a book coming out next year, Smuggling Jesus Back into the Church. That's sad. We want to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, it gives us to see Jesus. Number two is this. During COVID, I sometimes felt we were unfaithful the way we spoke as believers because God holds our future, and God holds the future in His hands, and we have a peace in regards to the future. That's number two. We have peace. Whatever is happening in the world, we have peace. Why? Because God holds the future. And he holds my future and your future. Number three is this. We have hope. Christians, we have hope. And we need to share our hope and speak about our hope. It's like the two uh, funerals I'm having on Wednesday and Friday in one sense are easy because it's Christians. We have hope. And I hope, I trust that by preaching Revelation will make us excited that swift to its close ebbs out life's little day. But we have hope. But number four is this. What about the lost? What about the unconverted? If the Lord Jesus Christ was to come tonight, family, neighbors, friends are facing the things in the book of Revelation. I believe the book of Revelation should do two things to us. I believe it should make us more prayerful for the lost and share the gospel with the lost. Fifthly, I believe it gives us a deeper appreciation of the cross. Because what we've got in Revelation is the wrath of God. But Christ on the cross bore my wrath, the wrath that I deserved. I was walking uh, late last week, and it was a stormy night, and I was walking by in the, uh, the Seton and Cullen. It's a healthy drive I'm on just now. And all I heard was the sea. And in that moment, I was thinking in Revelation, there's a sea pounding, but there's refuge in the harbor. Christians, Christ bore the wrath that we deserved on the cross. And in the book of Revelation, there is no other book in the, in the New Testament, I think, apart from Revelation, eh, Hebrews, that gives us the blood of Christ more than the Revelation. Chapter 1, Chapter 5, chapter 7, chapter 11, the blood of Christ, an appreciation that we are safe from all the things because we're sheltered under the blood. And sixthly, 
I believe it teaches us in worship. Revelation 4 of 5, the curtain will be drawn aside and we'll be taught and we will see what worship will be like in heaven and maybe it can teach us today in regards to worship. And also in singing, because there are 10 songs in the book of Revelation. So there's a lot of songs that we can learn, uh, learn from the songs in the book of Revelation. I can't even remember what the seventh one was, but I was told that seven was too many. Maybe six is too many. But I believe the book of Revelation has got things to teach us and change us. But interesting, if you look here at the verse three, where it says, and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. That word keep means this, while holding fast, we are continually hanging on to or as one commentator said about it, it implies a need for watchfulness in order in case these things are taken away. So what he's saying there is this, is you have to keep hold of these truths. And in that webinar yesterday, this is what he said at the very end. He says, it's serious today He believes it's a shortcoming in the Christian church that we have lost the truth of the second coming. And we need again, he said, to recover the truth of the second coming. Because he says, how can we survive in our day in the darkness that is descending upon us? How can we survive without the hope of Christ's return? And this is how we end it. He says, get it back in the mix. And I trust as we do Revelation, we'll get it back in the mix, the second coming, the reign of Christ, but also the wrath of God, the judgment of God. I believe that we have lost this in our churches today. I really feel this so strongly and burdened. One commentator said, I quoted in the prayer meeting, hell has disappeared and no one has noticed. J.I. Packer says this, Church of England theologian that died last year, the subject of divine wrath has become taboo in modern society and Christians by and large have accepted the taboo and conditioned themselves never to raise the matter. Unbelievers disbelieve it and Christians ignore it. Christians ignore it. If you go back to the revivals, what happened in the revivals were this, is that people were awakened to the wrath of God, that they were sinners under the judgment of God. And in that moment, there was a cry in Bucky and a cry along this coastline, what must I do to be saved? as they sought for refuge because they realized that they were sinners and they flocked to our churches and our churches were full because people realized they were lost. And we preached Christ and Him crucified. And we preached the blood of Christ. And we preached there is only one Savior. And we need to preach this with earnestness and entreaty like never before. Why? Why? The answer is in verse 1 and 2. Why do we need to be, have a, a burden upon us? Why do I need, and those of us who stand up here, we cannot be casual today, brothers and sisters. People are facing judgment and eternity. We cannot stand in the pulpits of our country today with casualness. Why? Because of the things in verse 1 which must soon take place. For it says in verse 3, for the time is near. Soon, it will be too late. Soon it will be too late. God's judgment will come relentlessly upon the unconverted. You know, I find this really hard to preach on. What is the day we're in today? 
believers, what is the day we're in today? This is a day that God is saving souls. This is the day that God is rescuing. Christ is what today, brothers and sisters? He is Savior. He is a Savior of the lost. This morning, Tara and Amy are a witness to that. Jesus saves. In the evangelical now newspaper that I get in November, it told the story of South Asia, of a man called Ali and his two translators who were Christians who headed to this dangerous part of South Asia, Asia to share the gospel. But the risk was great because of kidnapping, human trafficking, and murders that took place. And when they arrived in this part of uh, Ditnagi names, it just described a very dangerous part of the world to share the gospel. It was an Islamic holiday and everything was shut and they met this man called Rahim who was sweeping outside his house and they shared with him why they were there. And this man was a Punjabi Christian. And Punjabi Christians, are speakers are few, where if and Punjabi Christians are even fewer. And he took him back to his house, and the Rahim's son Raj came in, and he was delighted because he was wanting someone to come and teach them the Word of God. And this Ali the tr and his two translators had a short nap, and they were asked to come along to a room, and there were 40 people there to hear the gospel. It describes men and women, civilian, military personnel, and they listened to this man preach the gospel. And this is what it said. He shared the good news and preached, and 28 people gave their lives to Christ. Men jumped for joy upon accepting Jesus. Women removed the veils in celebration. By 2 a.m., the townspeople were still hungry to learn more about Jesus. 28 conversions in one instant. What is the day we're in? The day that we're in is the days of God's grace. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. For God has not sent his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world may be saved through Christ that the people in Bucky may be saved through him, that the people in Scotland may be saved through him, that the people across secular Europe may be saved through him, that people throughout the world may be saved through him. For God has not sent the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world may be saved through Christ. That is the days we're in. But we're reminded in Revelation that the time is near. And soon, that day will, be, day will end. And when that day ends, there's only one certainty for those who are without Christ. The book of Revelation is the revealing of the Lord Jesus. It's a word of God and there's a blessing for us in preaching it and in reading it and listening to it. I close with two questions tonight before we sing our last hymn and Alison will close us in prayer. Two questions is this. The first question I ask is this. Where will they be? Where will they be? We have all these in our lives. Where will they be? Where will they be in eternity? The last question I ask is this. Where will you be? Where will you be? I'm glad that I can say this this evening as I stand here. I'm so glad at the age of 10, I gave my life to Jesus. 
Life is uncertain. No one knows about tomorrow. But I am so glad that I can say this this evening. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul.